Hey everyone, welcome back for the end of week number six. We're going to talk about sex linkage and chromosomes. So, the objectives, or at least the two pages of objectives, <clears throat> and what we're going to go over. Last time we dealt with non or variations from Mendelian genetics, so we looked at some non Mendelian alleles. We looked at, you know, traits are co dominant, they're equally expressed. Incompletely dominant, meaning I don't see a dominant recessive relationship. I get something in between with the heterozygote. And the concept of multiple alleles. The concept of multiple alleles led to allelic series. We also dealt with the concepts of pleiotropy, meaning one uh, gene gives you multiple phenotypes. The concept of a lethal allele, which is an example of pleiotropy. The phenomenon of reduced penetrance, meaning just because you happen to have the dominant allele does not mean that it gets expressed or it appears. You don't necessarily see the phenotype. And expressivity, meaning that the extent to which a phenotype appears can vary. We also looked at different types of mutations. Wild type, which is obviously not a mutation, versus a null mutation, meaning we get no function. Silent mutations, you can't tell. Leaky mutations, where sometimes they work, sometimes it doesn't. And then with that leaky, we dealt with the concept of a dominant mutation, like a gain of function or a dominant negative. We also started dealing with gene interactions, in particular the concept of complementation, which is a way of identifying genes involved with different um, mutations. And this, of course, is most famous when you happen to have a enzyme series of converting, you know, product A or substrate A to product B, which is then turned into product C, which is turned into product D, which is then turned into product E. And we can have mutations at each of these enzymatic points, and we can actually figure that out using complementation. We also looked at epistatic interactions where genes are actually influencing what we observe along with cytoplasmic inheritance, such as, <coughs> excuse me, the idea of chloroplasts being inherited through the female or um, mitochondria being inherited through the female if you're dealing with like a mammal or what have you. Chromosomes, when we think of them, turn out to show up as a set. And if we were to look at the entire set of chromosomes that you happen to have, it's referred to as a karyotype. In particular, we always look at metaphase chromosomes because they are fully condensed, and it makes it so they're really easy to then sort. And we can sort them using a computer, like this karyotype here. This actually would be <coughs> a classic human male. So the diploid number that we turn out to see is 46. And we're being told that it's an XY, meaning it's a male. So when I look at this, Chromosome 1 looks about the same, chromosome 2 looks the same, chromosome 3 looks the same, and we see them in pairs, which makes sense because half from mom, half from dad. Same thing with 4, 5, all the way down to get to chromosome 22. Here we don't necessarily see the banding patterns, which are where the term chromosome comes from. It means a colorful body. But there turn out to be, if you were to stain these chromosomes, there's banding patterns. And we can actually observe and see that, oh, look, chromosome 1 have similar banding patterns, whether it comes from mom or dad. When I look at these chromosomes, it looks like 1 through 22 is always going to be the same. No matter what human I look at, 1 through 22 will be the same. But then we happen to have these last two. We label these last two as either an XX or an XY. And it turns out, classically speaking, females are XX and males are XY. One of the catches that we need to keep in mind is I'm speaking broadly and under a historic lens. There are exceptions to all of this. But ignoring all of that, which seems insensitive given, you know, modern sensibilities, but when we talk about this stuff, we're going to be using it in a very general sense, not 
necessarily applying to an individual case because there are cases where you could be an XY female and you could be an XX male. So we're ignoring those pieces. Individuals who turn out to be XX are referred to as homogametic, meaning all of their chromosomes turn out to be paired, whereas those who are XY are deemed to be heterogametic, meaning the two, they don't actually have two fully matching sets. Because if you look at this individual here in this figure, uh, 1 through 22, they match, but when we get to the X and the Y, they, they don't match, which means we actually don't have two matching sets of chromosomes because this X and Y thing is kind of messing it up. This figure here actually shows some of the banding patterns. So you can notice like here, we have similar patterns. I just got an email between darks and lights. And when we reference banding patterns, that's what we're talking about. This one here is obviously also an XY male where, for whatever reason, the Y chromosome is not being shown, but details. The study of genes and how they link to chromosomes actually was associated with this gentleman, Thomas Hunt Morgan, and one of his grad students, Alfred Stervant. Um, Stervant actually figured out a lot of stuff that we now talk about but it was before he got his PhD, so the result is, classically speaking, his PhD advisor, Thomas Hunt Morgan, gets the credit, even though Thomas Hunt Morgan did not do the work. This here is Thomas Hunt Morgan. They worked with the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, which is one of the model organisms when we deal with um, genetics, just because they're small, they're easy to raise, they have pretty obvious phenotypes, they have four chromosomes, it's really easy. But like I said, they, uh, the two of them noticed that there was a relationship between genes and chromosomes. And they also started to notice, as we saw in that previous slide, how some chromosomes seem to differ between male flies and female flies. And they named these chromosomes either autosomes, meaning everyone or every fly has them, because obviously they dealt with flies, and then they dealt with what they called sex chromosomes. And these sex chromosomes differed based upon the fly's sex. When I look at the human chromosomes, like we already pointed out, our diploid number is 46. There are actually a whole bunch of them, and each one turns out to be associated with different types of diseases. So in our lab, we're actually looking at different diseases for each of the chromosomes because each lab is actually assigned a totally separate chromosome. But when I look through these all, like if you wanted to study Lou Gehrig's disease, you look at chromosome 21. If I wanted to look up polycystic kidney disease, I would look at chromosome 16. If I wanted to look up oh, Huntington's disease, we saw that one last time, it's on chromosome number four. We can actually associate diseases, thus we can associate genes, with chromosomes. So when we look at those sex chromosomes, we refer to them as X and Y in mammals. So in mammals, we call them sex chromosomes, or we call them X and Y. And when we look at these X and Y chromosomes, and I have this on the next slide, they turn out to have a region called a pseudo-autosomal region. Even though the X and the Y chromosomes, when we look at them, as I go back, they're quite different in size, clearly something happens during meiosis between them. So this pseudo-autosomal region are where the X and the Y match. And this allows for them to pair up in prophase 1 and then get separated in anaphase 1. Usually when we think of genes associated with the X and Y chromosome, there are lots that are associated with the X 
chromosome, there aren't as many with the Y chromosome. When we reference to genes that are found on either the X or the Y chromosome, we call these sex-linked. Or sex-linked traits or sex-linked genes. This obviously leads to an issue, and that is if you look at a classic female, she will have two X's and a male will have only one X. So how do we deal with the fact that you know, the number of chromosomes are different? Because obviously the chromosomes have genes, some of those genes produce proteins, and how can you have one individual having double the amount of X chromosome protein than the other individual? So this is what we call the dosage problem. And it turns out that there is a method to solve it, and it's called X chromosome inactivation. The details of the process are not what we need to focus on, but basically what happens is during development, cells will inactivate one of the chromos of one of the X chromosomes. Which one it is is not necessarily coordinated, so the result is you can get splotchy patterns that appear. If you've ever heard of a calico cat or a tortoiseshell cat, which are these two right here, they are examples of this X chromosome inactivation. Their fur color turns out to be a sex link trait. So if you have, you know, the embryo when it turns out to be only a handful of cells. And if we have my two X chromosomes and I take out, let's do this in a different color. Um, the first one over here, all the cells from that particular, or all the resulting cells from that particular cell is going to only have one of those X chromosomes that will be activated. But if I take this front one here and I have my two X chromosomes, if, assuming I put them in the same order, but in this one, I inactivate the one on the right, I could get a totally different banding pattern, especially if I happen to have traits that are, heter if you know the genotype turns out to be heterozygous. So I can get some parts of a cat being black. I get other parts that turn out to be orange. And this is because of different cells early on inactivating different chromosomes. We get the exact same thing over here with what we would call the tortoise shell cat. So when we look at these chromosomes, like I pointed out, we have these pseudo-autosomal regions. They are somewhat sizable. Um, if there is going to be recombination between the sex chromosomes, this is where we would have recombination. The catch that also happens, and this is one of the things I pointed out to you at the start of class, is the SRY gene is right next to the pseudo-autosomal region. So every once in a while, it could be recombined, and then we get an SRY gene on an X chromosome. That X chromosome inactivation that I pointed out to you results in a thing referred to as a bar body, which is this chunk right here that you cannot, let me zoom out, there we go, which is this thing right here. So this right here turns out to be an inactive X chromosome. And the way it turns out to work is it is so condensed meaning it's heterochromatin, that it can never express itself. The entire chromosome. There are different ways of actually dealing with dosage compensation. It really just depends on what the organism is. So when we look at us, mammals, 
what we will do is we'll take one of the chromosomes and we just inactivate it. Simple as that. For other organisms, what we actually turn out to do is we can actually double the amount of expression. So if you turn out to be XY, we just double the X chromosome transcription. So mammals, we cut it in half by just eliminating one of the X choices. With other organisms like Drosophila, what you do is you actually just double the transcription in the X chromosome in the male. Then we could also have this one here, C, which deals with a worm, C. elegans. And what we do is, if you turn out to be heterozygous, or if you're homozygous, we just cut down the amount of transcription done by each. So that turns out to match the male. So there's various ways by which we can actually do this. There are other more complicated patterns that exist, but we don't necessarily care for any of those. When I look at sex chromosomes, there are patterns that can be found across different groups of organisms. So as I already alluded to, mammals, males are typically XY, females are typically XX. When it comes to birds, however, the males are homogametic, and it's the females who are heterogametic. Which means if you're doing a problem that involves sex chromosomes or traits linked to sex chromosomes, you do need to pay attention to if it is a mammal, or if it's a bird, or if it's a lepidopteran. So lepidopterans are moths and butterflies. Dipterans are things like flies. Hymenoptera, so hymenoptera turns out to be bees and wasps. They actually follow a you actually either have two X chromosomes or you are haploid. You only have one X chromosome. So XO means one X chromosome. So depending on where you are, it changes what the X chromosome or the sex chromosome patterns are. Because you all know I'm obsessed with the platypus, this figure here are the sex chromosomes of the platypus. So... It turns out that the platypus has five X chromosomes, and the male would have those five X chromosomes paired up with five Y chromosomes, and it's always together. The part that is somewhat interesting is they don't necessarily match, as you can see here, they do not necessarily match the X or the Y chromosome in mammals for the rest of what we would call eutherial mammals, so the ones that have a placenta. But part of their one of their chromosomes, actually two of them, end up matching one of the bird chromosomes. It's actually really strange. So when we look at these traits, it turns out that it matters what sex we're dealing with when we have sex-linked traits. So an example, the white eye mutation that I told you about last time, the one that also turns out to have a pleiotropic effect of it kills off uh, those who have the white eye mutation early. If I were to take a red-eyed female and cross a white-eyed male, as you see in this figure, all the offspring turn out to have red eyes. But if I then cross the red-eyed males and females from the F1, all of the females have red eyes, but I then get a 50-50 split with the males being white eyes or red eyes. Which is kind of, okay, so clearly something's going on. But if I were to take what we call the reciprocal cross, so what we mean by that is just switch the sexes. So in cro the first cross we did, the female had red eyes, the male had white eyes. So the reciprocal cross would be, had the male with white eyes and the female with red eyes. Just change that. What do we get when we look at the F1 generation? They're half red, half white. All the females have red eyes, all the males have white eyes. 
and when I start looking at the offspring, I get four options. Half of the females have red eyes, half of them have white eyes, half of the males have red eyes, half have white eyes. The fact that these two crosses do not give you the same results is evidence of sex linkage. It is one of the big telltale signs that, wait a second, we definitely have sex linkage. The fact that we're getting something different showing up between males and females, okay, that could be a little sus. But the fact that when I do the reciprocal cross, I get vastly different results, yeah, sex linkage is going on. We also can note that in this particular case, once we start working out the details, is the male only turns out to have, if I were to start to apply symbols, only one allele. Hey, that violates Mendel's law of segregation, and the answer is yes, it does. So, for the male, in this particular case, he is always going to be deemed to be hemizygous. Not homozygous or heterozygous. Always will be hemizygous, because there's only one copy. Also of note, when we write down genotypes for anything that is sex-linked, typically if it's on the X chromosome, what we're going to do is we're going to write Xs, and then we'll write as superscripts whatever is going on in terms of the alleles. So dominant, recessive, you know, capital letter, lowercase letter, pluses, minus, something like that. If something's on the Y chromosome, we would write it also as a superscript. So you always, for anything that's sex-linked, doesn't matter if we're talking XY or ZW, you always put the symbols as superscripts. This is actually what was going on if we were to look at this in terms of the actual cross that we had before, where... In the first cross, the female happens to have two X chromosomes and carried the red eye alleles. The male is hemizygous and had the white eye allele. When we look at the second cross, it's the opposite. So the female has two X chromosomes. Both of them are white alleles. The male is hemizygous for the red allele. And as you go through from parents to F1, or here it says P1 gamete. So if we go to F1 to F2, we could follow along what's going on with the males and females, and you could actually see that there starts to become a pattern. So when we start looking at traits that seem to affect like predominantly one sex or the other, it also makes us think, oh, this might be sex-linked, or it might be on the X or Y chromosome. Typically what we see when things are sex-linked in us, in mammals, is it mainly affects males. So that's usually the giveaway. And if you see a trait that mainly affects males, it's probably a trait on the X chromosome. And then we, of course, refer to this as a sex-linked trait or an X-linked trait. Y-linked traits are insanely rare. And by rare, I mean there's like three of them. Or something like that. Some of you in lab, you ended up reading this paper here. Dealing with TBL1Y. And this actually turns out to be a potential Y-linked trait. So it's still a sex-linked trait. But in particular, this is a Y-linked one. Why is this a big deal? Because if we only have and I'm making up this number, but three Y-link traits, we went from three to four, that's a huge increase. We went up by a third, by 33%. Like, it's a big deal. There are many disorders found associated with sex linkage, meaning it's on the X or the Y chromosome, predominantly the X chromosome. So among the ones that you probably heard of would be like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, where your muscles don't work. Male pattern baldness, always thank the mom. Hemophilia, at least one version of hemophilia where your blood doesn't clot. Hypertrichosis, which is when you get when you're really hairy. Um, it does help 
if when you start working problems that involve sex linkage, you do need to pay attention to what organism it is. Because if you're told, oh yes, and we're dealing with color or whatever, and you don't and you ignore the fact that they're talking about birds, when birds, males are homogametic, and it's the females who are heterogametic. As opposed to if you're dealing with, say, um, flies, because in flies, the male is the heterogametic one and the female is the homogametic one. It is very important to pay attention to what you're, the, um, what type of species you're dealing with. What I then want to do for the rest of class is actually just go through problems. Because this only makes sense if we work lots of problems, to be honest. Well, let's talk about your homework. And next week, you're going to be dealing with pedigrees. You're also going to be given two strips of PTC paper in lab. You can cut, up, cut it up into little pieces, so you know, you'll have a strip like this, but you can cut it up into little chunks. And what you want to do is take each chunk and test a family member. And you test as many people as you can. And what you want to do is see, can they taste it? It's going to be a yes or it's a no. If you put it on your tongue and you say, I don't know if I can taste it, the answer is no, you can't. And if you have a reaction to tasting it, the answer is yes. So if you look at the person and the person isn't doing anything, the answer is no.